very special conversation. I have with me Dr. Lopsang Sange. He is the political heir to the Dalai Lama. He's also been the former president of the Tibetan government in exile from 2011 to 2021. And well, he's someone who's going to tell us a lot about India, China, and the silent battlefield between the two countries, which of course is Tibet. Welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Good to be on your show, Priya Ji, and uh, good to see you online. Uh, but before, you know, I would also like to your help in helping our viewers understand the geopolitics of the region. And uh, should we start with the Prime Minister's recent visit to Bhutan? You know, Bhutan is a country where even China has made an outreach and India has also, you know, the Prime Minister's, one of his last visits before the elections has been to Bhutan. What is your take on that? No, I think it's good that uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, is visiting Bhutan now, um, because you know if you look at the neighboring countries with the you know unfortunate development in Maldives, you know, a lot of pressure in Nepal and obviously Pakistan being a you know um, permanent ally of China, you can clearly see you know, India surrounded by countries which should be India's domain in some sense, but the you know, increasing influence and penetration of Chinese presence from Sri Lanka to Bangladesh, you know, is well known. So, yes, and Bhutan is uh, and has been uh, the most trusted, actually, you know, uh, partner of India. And now uh, Bhutan is under tremendous pressure to settle the border uh, between Bhutan and Tibet, actually, now uh, under, with the Chinese government. And then the whole, you know, Dokla area, the chicken neck, all come into uh, consideration. So it's a good move on the part of India to, you know, strengthen the relationship with the newly elected, you know, uh, Prime Minister of Bhutan, Singh Topkil, who is also a Harvard graduate, by the way. Oh, so that is something you have in common with him. Uh, but, you know, uh, before we also go on to the other area, I think the heart of the matter is, you know, the Dalai Lama and his reincarnation. You know, we have China, of course, trying to come into the matter. The Dalai Lama has already, there is a process for his reincarnation, which, you know, he's 92 years or 90 plus the 14 Dalai Lama. So what is the process of reincarnation and what is the fight all about? If you can explain to our viewers and the political implications of it. You know, in 2011, September, His Holiness Dalai Lama has made it very clear as far as his reincarnation is concerned. Obviously, it is only him who could decide on his reincarnation, right? But then the Chinese government has been saying, no, it is the Chinese government who will decide his reincarnation. I mean, it's bizarre, it's illogical, you know, but then they make that uh, claim. So His Holiness jokingly say that if you're so interested in reincarnation, you should first find reincarnation of Mao Zedong and Chao Enlai and Teng Shopping, the Communist Party leaders who have died, then, you know, uh, have some credibility in, in a talking about a reincarnation system. Now, the U.S. government has also made it very clear. It is for the Dalai Lama to decide and no one else, right? Now, China wants to interfere uh, because they know it has geopolitical significance. Whole of Himalayan belt has strong mm. Buddhist presence and mainly you know, the Solonist Dalai Lama as their leader. Mongolia has, you know, Mongolia is majority Buddhist and they follow Dalai Lama. And also in, you know, Russia, three republics, Cuba, Kalmyk, and, you know, um, uh, Buret are all Buddhist. They follow, uh, you know, his Solonist Dalai Lama. So from Russia to Mongolia to the whole of Himalayan belt, now Buddhism is increasingly popular uh, in the West. For example, third largest religion in Italy is, you know, is Buddhism. Uh, fourth or the fifth uh, in uh, France is Buddhism. So His Solonist influence globally and regionally is so significant that they also, the Chinese government, they want to control over the selection of the Dalai Lama, which is bizarre, which they have no right, no credibility whatsoever. Uh, has the Chinese uh, identified the reincarnation? Have they got a candidate in mind? Because the Dalai Lama himself has not yet indicated who the reincarnation is, or has he? What is the where do we stand? Yeah, yeah from some sources, it's pretty, pretty clear that they are uh, in you know full fledged uh, 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 plan, and then they are also in the implementation phase. They have a twenty plus members committee, and they have a huge museum in Beijing and in Asa where, you know, there's exhibition about reincarnation uh, of the Dalai Lama, where Chinese government claims they have uh, right to say. And also they sent 
uh, last uh, November, the governor and party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region to uh, Singapore, Burma, Nepal, Maldives, you know, some of these ASEAN Buddhist countries. Actually, governor and party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region have no business when it comes to foreign policy, but they are already making these efforts. And then they're publishing articles, and they're, I'm sure they're making documentaries. So their propaganda machine is coming all out to build their narrative uh, as far as reincarnation of Dalai Lama is concerned. So which is very disturbing, hence we all have to be alert, including the government of India, should make it very clear that it is for His Holiness Dalai Lama to decide on his reincarnation and no one else. Because historically in India, for thousands of years, the emperors and kings you know, and the chiefs of any uh, Indian communities have never interfered in the selection of Shankar Acharya or Pandit or anything. They have always left it to religious community and religious followers. Similarly, Indian government can say, this is our past tradition. Religious matters should be, you know, restricted to religious community. In this, in this case, it is for the Tibetan community and His Holiness Dalai Lama to decide on his reincarnation. You've written a lot on this subject, and you've also written this. What you have said, you know, that India should now come out openly, and even the U.S. should make it very clear that it is up to the Dalai Lama to decide, and not an communist atheist country like China to interfere. Um, but how does it work, you know, on ground? Uh, you know, how, how if the reincarnation happens according, you know, uh, uh, how will the Dalai Lama indicate to you who his successor is? No, in two thousand eleven. Yeah, in 2011, he has said he will decide at the age of 90, uh, which is next year. Wow. So anytime from July of next year to June of 2026, he will be 90 years old. So he could make the statement. But normally, you know, he will say, okay, uh, that I will come back because the followers, Tibetans and Buddhists around the world want him to come back. Then mm -hmm. he could appoint a regency or he could appoint uh, you know, a designated person and then assign his office, Gandhan Potam, who will be the key uh, coordinating office, you know. So that's how it works. And then the search committee will be formed. And so they have to find candidates all over the world. Uh, you know, Solonis is very, very clear. If Tibet issue is not solved, he will be born outside of Tibet. That is outside of China, not inside. So hence, you know, so this is how uh, uh, the uh, process takes place. And then... If you read his book, My Land and My People, there's a chapter on finding of the Fourteen Dialogue, which is beautifully written. I recommend people to read that. I will, in fact, I haven't read it, but I will read it for sure. Uh, you know, China and India, Tibet is one issue. Then there is also in Arunachal, you know, China has uh, again taken note of the Prime Minister's recent visit there and they've, you know, been upset about it. He went to inaugurate a tunnel over there, the Sela Tunnel. So how do you see China interfering in everything, you know, in small matters like this also? You know, China always claimed that Arunachal Pradesh, particularly Tawang area, uh, yeah. is part of China. Uh, because it was South Tibet historically. Right? Hence, when Prime Minister Modiji visited Tawang uh, uh, and uh, you know, inaugurated Zela Pass, uh, they protest. They say, you can't do that. Thankfully, just uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday, U.S. government has come out and said, yes, Arunachal Pradesh is part of India. You know, so, so U.S. government has also come out in support of India's stand. And the Chinese government uh, is not happy, and they have protested that statement as well. I mean, as we are talking about reincarnation, this mm. sixth Dalai Lama was born in Arunachal Pradesh, a Tawang area. Recently, I visited that uh, temple as well, right? So, Chinese government also made the claim that no Dalai Lama was born outside of China, hence the 15th Dalai Lama also cannot be born outside of China. Thereby, they yeah. are saying, Tawang is part of China, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, hence, you know, the, India has no right on this matter as well. So, yes, there is this, you know, protesting Zella Pass, because it, it, it builds a tunnel and then connects, uh, you know, uh, the mainland India with the mountains of, you know, uh, Arunachal Pradesh. But the uh, Chinese government says, you are building a tunnel in our territory, right? And then there is uh, also uh, an issue of, you know, Six Dalai Lama born in Tawang. So these are all part of the, you know, uh, uh, conspiracy 
or or their plan, their strategy uh, to claim over Taiwan and protest anything that happens in uh, Arunachal. So, post Galwan, how, how have you seen India-China relations? You know, uh, post twenty twenty. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was there uh, in India. It was unfortunate. You know, twenty plus uh, Indian soldiers were killed. I mean, brutally. You know. Uh, and then, yes, uh, it seems four or five uh, Chinese soldiers were also killed because the Chinese troops, they made incursion into the uh, Indian area and attacked them at night, right? So that has been a turning point. Uh, as far as the uh, mindset of Indian people at large, uh, because, you know, India always believed in dialogue uh, to solve the issue. And there has never been violence per se. I mean, there, there was war in 1962 and a few occasions. But in the last 30, 40 years, it has generally been uh, non-violence, right? Mm -hmm. Non-violent uh, uh, border area. But then Galwan, you know, tragic incident uh, changed everything. So what it says is that China is an expansionist empire, right? If you look at the map of China, it's only 40% of China's territory is where 90% of the Han Chinese people lived between Yellow River and Yangtze River, right? Now, all these other 60% of the area are Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, Manchuria, they occupied it. So now by pushing uh, in Galwan and, you know, Doklam and Arunachal Pradesh and into Nepal and all the border areas, it clearly shows that China is an expansionist empire. And then now in South China Sea, East China Sea, they're making claims in, in the ocean as well. So right. we all should be aware that it is an expansionist, expansionist empire and, you know, India should be on alert. How do you, uh, do you see India's handling of the Ukraine war, positioning itself vis-a-vis -vis Russia, Ukraine, China, and, you know, all the geopolitics of it? Yeah, initially, you know, uh, it, it, was, it looked a bit complex because, you know, uh, Russia invading another independent country, Ukraine, look like clear violation of sovereignty and international law, right? So all the countries in the world should come out and say, this is strong. But India's past relationship with uh, Russia uh, and its dependency for arms and also for energy, right? So India was a bit nuanced, but then now I think people have come to understand why uh, India is taking that stand. Having said that, I do believe invading one country by another country uh, is wrong. Uh, similarly, Tibet was an independent country, was invaded, occupied by China. So that that's the principle I take. We see China making uh, you know overtures to Pakistan. You know they are also trying to engulf India by you know approaching each and every neighbor from Nepal, whether it is uh, Bhutan or even now Pakistan. I mean Pakistan, they've been of course uh, going for a long time. So how do you see India pro proceeding in uh, given this background? No, I think uh, uh, India's foreign policy was mainly focused on Pakistan, you know, at right. least till 10, maybe 15 years. Now it has shifted. Um, the former uh, and late uh, defense minister, George Fernandez, you know, used to say, China is number one threat. I used to say this in 1990s, right? And people mm -hmm. didn't take him seriously. So now, you know, China, uh, India has realized that, you know, uh, China is the potential number one threat. Having said that, China is fully supporting uh, Pakistan. Pakistan economy, you know, Pakistan um, the defense, all are supported by, you know, uh, China. Um, and then obviously uh, they're building this highway connecting from, you know, seaport uh, okay. through Pakistan to, uh, you know, Xinjiang. Uh, so clearly, in Sri Lanka so, also. So they are, you know, it's like they're engulfing all of India's neighbors. That's true. But then so far, now uh, Pakistan is in crisis, major crisis, right? So if China is truly a friend of Pakistan, they should be coming out now and helping them a great deal, you know. But then now, Pakistan is asking for money everywhere, but China is not providing as, you know, expected. Uh, so when you rely too strongly on China, you know, they won't come out uh, on time or when you need them the most. This is also a lesson for uh, Pakistan. Now, in the case of Sri Lanka too, right? 
Well, mm. it was investors, you know, who provided billions of dollars with food yeah. and energy. It was India, finally, you know. So there is a realization in Sri Lanka that actually when push comes to shop, a true friend comes at a time of need and India did come. So so this is, you know, uh, this is a very uh, wise approach on the part of India. I also been reading some of your writings. You've been writing about the Chinese crackdown on Tibetan protests against the hydropower project. I think in Drichu River, if I'm not, if I've got it correct. What is? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain? Uh, you know what is happening over there? It's unfortunate uh, that China is building a dam uh, over mm -hmm. Drichu River in a place called Dege uh, in Tibet. Now, China has already built around four hundred dams small, medium, and large dams. Now, as far as electricity and power is concerned, we don't need any more dams because we have enough electricity and surplus with all these dams being built. But they're, they're building more dams. And then this project is both west, east project, and south, north project, which means they want to build this dam, generate electricity, and supply it to the eastern part of China for the Chinese companies. So this is to benefit Chinese companies and Chinese people, particularly Chinese politicians who own or co-own this you know, hydropower company. Mm -hmm. And also to the south-north uh, kind of project, they want to divert river water from this area, uh, from Yangtze to Yellow River. Uh, Yellow River is drying up, right? So this is all the benefit Chinese. Unfortunately, six monasteries, one built in 13th century, 700 years old monastery, will be drowned or submerged. Four villages will be drowned. So hence, Tibetans are protesting. Rather, if you look at the footages, they're begging Chinese officers, saying, we have lived here for hundreds and thousands of years. This is our home. Don't do this. But the Chinese officers are saying, yeah, we are doing it. And with utter disregard to Tibetan peoples, you know, uh, well-being. So, unfortunately, Tibetans are protesting, but now around 1,000 Tibetans, uh, you know, uh, are being arrested, they are in prison, including the officials, Communist Party officials of this area are, you know, uh, protesting. So, you know, this is uh, what it shows. The Chinese government always say that Tibetans have benefited being part of China. You know, Tibet being part of China. But in this case, you can clearly see it's clear exploitation of natural resources. Now, this is hydropower. And then, you know, if, if I have to go down the list of, you know, uranium and gold and copper, all kinds of minerals being exploited uh, from Tibet for the benefit of Chinese companies and Chinese politicians, the list is very long. So, you know, uh, it is a colonization of Tibet and exploitation of Tibetan resources. Uh, speaking of, how do you see, you know, um, in terms of India and the U.S., is there, you know, um, uh, there is, uh, U.S. is reaching out, is is it just an anti-China stand that is pulling India together? How, you know, what is the axis that you see coming together? Because there is also, you know, a realignment of uh, superpowers in terms of, you know, post-Russia, Ukraine. Uh, how do you see this geopolitics playing out? Uh, on the one hand, it's true. Uh, there is, you know, a great power rivalry um, a competition between China and America because America being number one, China aspired to be number one, and they have declared so. By you know, two thousand forty-nine, they want to be number one. So this is the uh, what Xi Jinping says, Chinese dream. You know, mm -hmm. uh, now to become number one, first they must be number one of the region that is Asia, right, okay. and then. And then, uh, and to be number one of Asia, you must get rid of or dilute or weaken number potential number twos, right? So, which are the countries which can claim to be number two in Asia? Mainly India, perhaps Japan. So, on its way to become number one of the world, China will do everything possible to undermine and weaken India so that there is no challenge uh, back in the region. So that's why, you know, interference in all these neighboring countries, like from Pakistan to Bangladesh to Maldives to uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, and increasing pressure on Bhutan are all indication that China is putting pressure, keeping all these pressure points mm. to, you know, weaken uh, and constrain or contain uh, India. So 
But then the you know great power rivalry and competition is real. It has come, and we have seen this uh, you know uh, in history. There is a book called Tuesday described by a famous uh, former dean of Harvard Kennedy School, which says that out of sixteen times when there was great power rivalry, twelve times was settled for war. So which means seventy five percent chances that there will be war in this great power rivalry, and Taiwan being the flashpoint, but all these border areas of India, you know, from Galwan to Arunachal to Doklam are also flashpoints. And with the U.S., you know, with Trump making a comeback in the U.S. presidential stakes, how do you see the U.S.-China-Russia equation playing out? Now, it's too early to say, you know, uh, which candidate will prevail, right, whether it's Donald mm -hmm. Trump or Biden, mm -hmm. uh, because election is sometime in November. But at the moment, the, all the polls uh, are showing they're very close. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, a touch and go. Uh, one could become. Uh, uh, but then, you know, when Trump was there, actually, he initiated these hardline policies towards uh, uh, China as well. Uh, and then President Biden has kept uh, the same uh, policies, you know, uh, and sanctions and increasing of, you know, uh, taxes uh, towards Chinese goods. But there is consensus in the U.S. Congress, whether it's Republican or Democrat, they all agree that China is number one rivalry and they must do everything possible to, you know, uh, check on China and thereby, you know, their uh, interests um, and then their, what you call, uh, uh, having closer relationship with India is part of the equation as well. And what about Russia? Because Trump has been very friendly with Russia, but you know now China and Russia have formed their own access. Uh, yes, uh, with Ukraine war, uh, you know, uh, because European countries have pushed or isolated uh, Putin uh, particularly, and then you know China has allied and they become quite closer. But you know, you will never know what will happen because uh, ultimately, left on its own. China and Russia has a lot of areas where they have disagreements and potential conflicts from Far East territory to Central Asia. Because on the one hand, yes, you know, China, the uh, Russia is aligning with uh, China now, but at the same time, Putin's goal is to become uh, revitalized or revive the great power or great empire, you know, uh, mindset. If that's the case, they don't want to lose their dominance in Central Asia or Far East, you know. Uh, Asia, and where uh, as you get closer, you know, Chinese, uh, you know, move into Central Asia. Uh, there, with Belt and Road Initiative and all these other projects, are weakening Russia, including in Mongolia, right? So uh, at the moment, it looks like they are, China and Russia are getting closer, but uh, from geopolitical point of view, there are more, uh, you know, uh, potential flashpoints uh, than common ground. Okay. On that note, thank you so much, Dr. Sange, for this interview. And we hope to have more conversations with you in the future. But for now, thank you very much. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.